Okay. So I just read your comments on it. Um, and there are a few interesting things. So we're in agreement that if we want to do locking, there is not really any way to do that in Postgres that gives us guarantees because we can only lock rows that exist. We can't lock inserts. That's not right. Um, well, technically, we could do something about it. We could create triggers which will update some d different rows, and we they, this. Uh, the, in this case, inserts will be blocked because of like implicit updates, but it's not a good idea in terms of performance and complexity. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other thing I am thinking about, you commented that in the threshold, the, the amount of time we'll need to wait to be sure the stream is caught up and how long we'll have to pause for might be like a minute. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping is that if we're only moving a single group at a time in a large mm -hmm. database then the amount of updates coming in for that group will be incredibly small like right so we have single wall stream and right. in our case we will need to like it we will need to consume it and, and filter filter out uh, right. useless data for us and and only keep only uh, capture changes uh, that we need. Technically, it should be possible, and uh, we can parallelize uh, like having several uh, multiple logical slots. Which, but how uh, will if if we pause right? How would we know we were caught up if we were filtering rows that were still coming through the wall stream for a different group? So, uh, in my I think like how it works, uh, we. Uh, we open the slot and it starts capturing uh, like it, it has some position position in terms of uh, LSN uh, log stream location log stream number so it's like uh, some number in in wall data wall data right ahead log uh, it has uh, some uh, incrementally growing uh, sequence number so uh, when we create slot it has some position and uh, the primary, by the way, we cannot uh, create logical slots on the on replicas, unfortunately. So it's a stress. All the stress will go to primary, but uh, okay. wall is created anyway. Uh, so we c create uh, this slot. It knows when it was created, and the primary will wait for consumers uh, who connects to this slot and starts reading this data, and. Uh, Till the like while it's not read yet, uh, it means that we need this these walls to be present on, on on the primary, so it will start accumulating them. So if you just open the slot and don't do anything, we will be out of disk space. This is very mm -hmm. big risk usually when we deal with logical replication. We need mm -hmm. to cover it very well with monitoring and alerts. So once consumer connected, it start consuming walls sequentially everything. And it's a responsibility of consumer what it, uh, what is needed to to be applied. So mm -hmm. it can it can apply nothing, for example, just throw everything away, or it can filter out some uh, rows, columns. It, it, it's possible to to fetch data from there. Uh, in wall, we when we change some row, for example, or insert some row, uh, it's written fully. So all columns are yep. present there. Uh, so we can understand. Uh, we can filter uh, based on that, right? So, so what else is important here? So, so mm -hmm. yeah, what I'm what I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around is we know we're only going to need to consume rows that relate to a specific group. So, let's to simplify mm -hmm. this, let's just say rows that have a column namespace ID equals to one. Okay. We're looking at that the wall, and then we're going to pause writing so that nothing can write with namespace ID one anymore to the mm -hmm. primary that, that is the producer of this wall. So the consumer, how does it know, how do we know when there is definitely not going to be anything from namespace ID one anymore, because the, the stream is going to keep constantly coming. So we, I yeah, guess we, we can, we, we, we should like, like one of the ideas, we just uh, apply everything, still apply everything related and we can be, 
like on on the receipt receiver side we can be already in special mode saying that we don't expect any changes for this uh, group or namespace so if it comes with raise some flag alert us uh, that, like it's not expected this is also a possible way to protect uh, yeah uh, the protection is one thing i'm just trying to think in the correct case do we just we don't look at when the the wall is empty because we can't because the wall will never be empty that that's what i was originally yeah, hoping for in my, in my head the yeah. algorithm would be like once you pause right then they'll you just wait until that queue is empty and then you're good but no. in this scenario i guess we have to wait until the the update in that queue is has a certain time stamp and uh, what you're describing is also possible but we need to uh, to have additional asynchronous uh, like queuing mechanism for example kafka or we have sidekick mm. right so in instead of uh for we, like we have this stream of everything walls we filter out what we need and we put it to another stream like uh, sidekick for example and from there we can consume already and once we put auto pause we don't have any changes for this group so it uh, we should expect that uh for me that doesn't logically second... solve the problem because sidekick's asynchronous there so you don't know i i think it, to me, that doesn't make any difference. If you put sidekick, take sidekick reading from the wall, writing it to another queue, then you don't know if sidekick is up to date <clears throat> in consuming the. Right, it may lag additionally, but uh, at least, uh, like at least we, we will don't, don't we won't we won't have, have anything from like. Usually, it's done with Kafka. There is Project Debezium. It's for, for like it takes from logical decoding data text and. Uh, uh, puts it to Kafka, then you can consume from there. But of course, it's additional. It it, it increases latency. It increases lag, of course. Yeah, but to get uh, the correct answer, I think the only way we can do this is to use like a timestamp to say that, like, I paused at this time, so I'm not yeah, going to bother I, reading I the wall. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. We don't need timestamp actually. So we uh, in Postgres uh, there there are two things. Uh, LSN is for, it's a kind of physical um, our, our physical time for wall for right ahead log there is also a transaction id it's right. more like a logical uh, thing if you take if you can read the like current transaction id for your transaction and, and uh, it will always increase and we know that it's uh two two four four byte integer so we have problems uh related to you probably heard about it uh, transaction id wraparound so every tuple physical row uh, in in postgres in any table has um date of birth like x x x min it's mm -hmm. transaction id uh, id of transaction which created this tuple and x max it's uh, like uh, date of de de death like uh, when uh, this tuple was deleted uh if it's zero it's not it's it's like definitely alive uh it can be also positive and still live if transaction was rolled back like we deleted but decided not to delete in the last like the last moment and rolled back transaction so looking at x you can just select x min where from table where id is something and see x min x min like uh transaction so, id which so created this row after we after we create the exclusive lock we then ask where Postgres is up to in terms of an X min. And then we stop we, reading once it gets past that. And remember transaction ID when we did it, for example. Okay. When we create the lock, we, re yeah. The only thing that's weird to me is we don't know where we're creating the lock right now. Or, or we, if we create the lock, like let's say if I created an application lock in Redis, I'm not going to have a transaction ID from Postgres. Right. Yeah, um, well, this is this is the distributed system problem already. Yeah, so I need to so. ask. I need to go to the Postgres primary, and I, I need to ask it for some like what its current time is, basically. But maybe in in the form of a transaction ID. Like, like I need to know what the time is now, and I'm going to expect that whatever this time is now, you are not going to read. You're not going to receive any more writes beyond that time, so that when I right. consume the write ahead log, I can stop reading when I hit that time because. I know that your write ahead log is not going to contain anything for namespace ID one anymore because I just locked everything before that right. before I got this transaction ID from you. Is that right? Correct? Uh, yes, it's correct. But also we need to implement this logic like to to prohibit writing. So every time yeah. we, we application is going to change any data which belongs to this namespace ID, it, uh, this log should be checked like if it exists, we don't do it. Yeah. Also, yeah. So oh, mm -hmm. to me, to me, that problem I know is solvable. I mean, 
I just okay. I can see we, we've got we've got the idea of using a Postgres table shared exclusive locking. Did but you it, think about retry logic in addition to this uh, locking? I, logic? I was wondering about retry logic or just block with timeout. So let's say the client wants a write connection for namespace ID one. They just ask for that client connection for namespace ID one, and they just have to wait. And if okay. they and they have a fifteen second timeout on their wait, so the um, the consumer, which is the browser that submitted the page, may have latency while they are trying to perform a write, but we never have to retry failed SQL queries, I guess. Well, it, like, there can't be failed SQL queries. That's the thing. Like, we can't attempt to write to Postgres when it's not meant to be written to, because Postgres doesn't understand that, it, for example, namespace ID one, and somebody's trying to comment on an issue. Postgres does not understand that you cannot insert into the notes table right now for that namespace and it, and it can't right. understand that yeah, so unless we do yes. in, unless we do the you know the hooks or whatever you, you, the triggers sorry that's what you describe them as but we don't want to go down that road right but, but if we know the context if we, if we can uh, have separate connection for uh, our current namespace id we can additionally make, make this connection explicitly read only even if it's primary which accepts read writes so we can just during yeah, but, a connection establishment, we can say that we establish connection in read, read, uh, read only. Yes, yeah, so, but you're still trusting mode. that you're still trusting the client, so it, it makes no difference, right? right? Like, there's no reason for us to request a read only connection from Postgres if, if the client's intention is to perform a write and then get a failure and retry. That right. I think that's that's yeah. what my thinking is. Like, the client is already we're already going to have to trust the client to ask for a read only connection. We should just trust the client to not ask for a connection at all if their intention is to write. Um, and that right. that's GitLab in this case. And and I think it works with the way the way this Rails connection stuff works in Rails six point one. You actually specify ahead of time whether you want a write connection or a read connection anyway. Um, and that'll be useful, obviously, for making sure we send the request to the primary or the replicas. But Additionally, we can use we can hook into that and say, look, you've requested a right connection, and I've just checked the lock, and there's an exclusive lock at present, so you, we will block. And so, yeah. to me, blocking seems. I don't think retry will necessarily be applicable because I don't think we're gonna we want we don't want to get failures from Postgres. There's um, there's no reason to get okay. Just uh, additional, like uh, to, to make it a little bit more complex, uh, we can uh, in Postgres pro uh, protocol, we can uh, also specify multiple hosts. So if uh, a client uh, asks for read write, like it, okay, it's it's different. It's for about physical replication more, more than we, we yeah. talk about. Like if we have lo the complex logic of locking rows, yeah, okay, skip. Sorry. Yeah. Let's keep it. The, the other the other thing I could think is like maybe Postgres could help us here if you could like request a write connection for namespace ID one. That that's that's where I could think maybe like if every client when they wrote they actually got a connection and and Postgres understood what the intention of that connection was, Postgres could actually say, oh, actually namespace ID one is locked right now. So any I would, I, I would think about uh, rather about uh, shard ID. Like we need to somehow um, translate like let's understand that this namespace is stored at that shard and then we have connection for some shard yeah. ID. And, and, and plus the, and legacy the, connection for old storage. Yeah. Well the, the reason that this won't work is because what we probably what we're what we're going to do, I mean maybe this depends on our terminology of what, what we mean by shard, but we're going to be putting multiple groups into the same shard. Of course. And, right. And, yes. and and because a shard, I think our current intention is a shard is a logical database in Postgres. And we can't have the overhead of one logical database per top level group in GitLab. It's just not. Right. That, that's this not this is why I, I, I say like that that connection should be established to shard where we have multiple namespace right. IDs. And we only want to block rights to one of those namespace IDs. So that's this, this is, is why questionable. Post this is questionable because maybe we need to think about multiple namespaces and uh, like switch yeah. all of them when they are already present in shard. That's certainly more efficient, but the problem I have with that is it doesn't help us with some known problems we're going to want to do. Like, let's say we're going to treat our current database as shard zero, and we want to move the GitLab all group you. up I understand there. you. I understand you. You think about uh, re rebalancing in the future to, to have this mechanism to yeah, be used. And... I, I agree, I agree, I agree. Like, we, yeah. we need to be able to move one uh, namespace between two shards. This, like, yeah. this is a very good, flexible 
and yeah, would think especially for especially for the initial migration because we have one database that's huge <laughs> but, right, but but right. i but okay, i agree okay. with you like the, the move everything like Elasticsearch has this idea of um splitting shards and and one of the tricks it does is it just goes i'm just going to copy that whole file system like now we're going to have everything replicated in both shards and then i'm going to perform a delete operation in both of those shards to halve it and this kind of like maybe is applicable for GitLab too that you know in in the same way you describe we copy a whole shard from somewhere to somewhere else what we could mm -hmm. do is copy the whole shard from somewhere to somewhere else and then you just kind of soft delete everything else in there and then later on you come back and you clean it but up and hard delete everything also if if we have some mechanism to like to, like if, if we don't shard based on based on some hash uh, which could be quite um inefficient in terms of uh, rebalancing capabilities. If, for example, we have some global table, which is stored somewhere, doesn't matter right now, uh, and it knows which uh, namespace ID is stored where, in this yep. case, we could introduce some concept that we have like old location and new location for each uh, namespace ID or group or yep. something. And in this case, we could still talk about not particular group transferring, but uh, multiple of them. Like yeah, we we decide to move these this set of groups to from this shard to that shard. In this case, again, it, it like it it would make sense to yeah. think about two connections for them, old one and new one. Yeah, it's just that even in that scheme you're talking about, you wouldn't we we didn't, we never want to block and move an entire shard at once, because mm -hmm. there is never value in moving an entire shard to another place because that's all that is is just replicate your data somewhere else. You're not you're not splitting. Um, okay. so, um, so we need an algorithm that splits a shard and therefore that means that you only ever want some subset of groups within a shard to be re read only for a period of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and, and anyway, in any case, the smaller you make, the smaller you make the unit that you're moving, the, the, the less impacted customers you have. Right. Um, I agree. Yes, but uh, yeah. overhead is in increased because uh, if we have like if if we measure some like uh, uh, operations that are needed to perform this moving and then this this transfer and then we like ch check all of them, it can be very long time. Yeah, especially if we have restrictions like I mentioned, uh, if we can operate uh, only at nights or weekends. Yeah, I think I think what long term the, the the migration stuff would look like. I imagine like we pick times when I mean one of the things we don't want to move these groups while there's a schema migration going on because this creates all sorts of other problems. But because um, mm, the, the, the wall won't the, it won't replicate schema changes. So um, what it's we, possible uh, there's some project I will send it in comment later. Uh, there, but there even if it did, arounds. even if it did, like that kind of causes more problems because, like, whatever schema migrations we have happening are supposed to happen to every shard, and so mm -hmm. we don't want those replicated from shard A to shard B when there's already mm -hmm. a, an independent process that's going ahead and okay. applying them. Right, so anyway, okay. what I'm imagining is that this the coordination of moving a group from somewhere else, somewhere to somewhere else, will be in dedicated times, and we'll probably pick mm -hmm. times to minimize disruption, and that might be the middle of the night in America and uh, for the weekend or whatever, mm -hmm. but. You know, or we might schedule those deliberately in different ways. But like initially, the first few moves are going to be like the biggest groups we have. Take our biggest mm -hmm. customers on .com and GitLab and just move them to a separate shard. Um, right. So, so okay, uh, what else? Like, the other, like thing, I, I, the other mm -hmm. thing I was concerned about is the initial, trans, the initial right. transfer of data, the initial load. And you mentioned, you linked to something that involved PG dump. And right. But PG dump right. is just the same as uh, uh, start transaction at repeatable read uh, level of isolation, and then just s s perform multiple selects. This is what PG dump does. So we can do it manually okay. in application. So I think what I'm understanding, and I'm probably going to get some of the terminology wrong, but I'm going to select a bunch of data from one database and transfer it to another database, and I'm going to get a right. transaction ID for that. And then I'll use that transaction ID to look in the right ahead log later to know where to start uh, reading from. All right, two things here. Uh, first, you cannot do it uh, just like you described because you need to raise isolation level because otherwise you will read inconsistent data. If you, for example, in one transaction, 
and default uh, default uh, default isolation level is uh, read committed in Postgres. So if we read from some table uh, in, in in transaction, and then we read from another table in in transaction, the data can be inconsistent. And even if we do perform two reads from the same table, we can see different data if another transaction committed between our two selects. Gotcha. So we so need to we change need to the raise app. repeatable okay. read. Yes, this is what PGDAM does. In this case, uh, we will deal with single snapshot of data, which uh, like we have snapshot isolation, so we 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 are okay. Second point, uh, right ahead log doesn't have transaction ID. Okay. So you can you cannot see it has LSN. As I just so we, we need to convert our transaction ID or we need to get this other type of ID, which is an X min, right? Is that like yes, we need to like I sent article from Michael Pacquer. I I'm I'm better. Yeah, that's the one I'm looking at right now. Right. So it explains the trick how you can uh, synchronize the state of okay. uh, logical slot and like find proper place in logical decoding stream and the transaction ID. So basically you need to create logical slot using, this is very important, uh, using not SQL, but logical replication protocol. It's quite simple, but just, uh, if you create logical slot using create, PG create logical slot or how is it called? It won't provide you a snapshot ID, unfortunately. Okay. But if you use uh, logical replication protocol, it will provide you a snapshot ID. And this is the only way to synchronize properly. Okay, so, so so what right. what happens here? We we create we create a um, we set the isolation level as you said. We we get a transaction and we do a PG dump in here, or we do the create replication no, slot. No, 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 we create slot first. Where is it? Okay. Yes, we create okay. slot first, and it returns our our our, uh, our snapshot ID, which corresponds to the beginning of uh, wall stream. That's here. this. Okay. One second. Yeah, why I cannot I cannot uh, draw on your skin, but yes, this is it. So okay. it, then we need to maintain this connection. Otherwise, this there is a big chance. There are big chances that this snapshot will be lost. Okay. So we need to keep this connection in which we created uh, replication slot. And we're going to use the, that connection to do a PG dump. No, no, no. This connection is used to tell Postgres that this snapshot is this should be should not be deleted, should not be lost. In second connection, we dump data. It can be PG dump, it can be just selects, but it should be in repeatable read, uh, repeatable read transactionization level. You so see it, good. repeatable read, right? And we can specify some, some different snapshot ID when we open transaction. Set so transaction uh, a snapshot. Oh, and we specify okay. The name. This is what you're saying. The second connection gets so the we ID move a little bit to the past. Yes. Right. Okay. We say, yeah, uh, yeah I want to read, but. Right from the past and I don't want anything to change because I'm using repeatable read. And right. therefore I know and that we, what I've we read. We work with, our, with someone else's uh, snapshot, not our snapshot. So we switch yeah. to the past. And, In this and, case, okay, we're and, fully and you're, synchronized. You're saying this, this, we need to tell Postgres not to get rid of this snapshot. Like, yeah, keep in connection, right. Keep the connection for this snapshot so that it exists indefinitely. Okay. This uh, is making sense to me, I think. Connection. Uh, it has, it's quite complex and I see uh, does not give, yeah, the creation of logical uh, with normal connection does not give give back snapshot name. So we cannot use function pg create logical application slot, unfortunately. Uh, so I see, I, 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 I've over a couple of years, I've uh, tested quite heavily uh, for different company. I've tested uh, several enterprise level uh, solutions like uh, Attunity, Fivetran. Fivetran, by the way, is good. Fivetran is good. By the way, we, we can uh, use it because they are on GCP as well. <laughs> People who are on AWS can, cannot use them because uh, they have uh, everything on GCP. So uh, since con consumption of wall is single threaded, if you move data between clouds, it's insane. Right, okay. Uh, so, but Attunity, for example, it's they are the biggest player on, on the market in terms of logical replication, logical uh, replication between different database systems. And Postgres to Postgres is also supported, of course. And then they fail to understand this simple thing, which just I just discovered. They they just create a slot using SQL, and that's it. And it's insane. 
so you have duplicates always because you have overlapping uh, st uh, processes and chances to have uh, duplicates are like 100 yeah if, even if you have like 10 tps that's it so so the interesting thing here that you talk about this this part is basically to say that any process that opens this replication slot cannot die it cannot lose its connection to postgres which is like a, a, a kept alive tcp connection we cannot exactly. lose that tcp connection for the entire duration of extracting this snapshot well uh, i i believe uh, once you said 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 transaction trans snapshot transaction snapshot you already like second user of this snapshot all oh, so right so if you lose this I, connection postgres knows it I'm still needs sure. this snapshot yeah i'm almost i'm almost sure yes okay so so how, that simplifies like, things a bit. Yeah. Right, right. Since it's single threaded, we, how can we parallelize it? We can open multiple uh, replication slots. So they all will have the same wall stream started in different uh, points of in time, of course. But then we ca different slots can work with different data. Right. So, for example, we can use one slot for one group or set of groups. That's why I think about set groups again, because over, there is overhead. For example, if we want to replicate thousands of groups at the same time, simultaneously, we we need a thousand of replication slots. I, I never did it. I I like okay. I never saw systems with so, so, so many slots. Okay. Only like maximum I, like do, do, dozen or something. I get what you're saying. And, and, and so you're thinking about this really large overhead and that probably factored into why you think we're more likely to end up with a one minute lag, right? Is it possible we can get a one second lag down for a single group, but there will be so much Postgres overhead of doing a single lag? Like, yeah. Right, lag is not related to the, like it's related to wall stream and we have huge wall stream right now. It's like 2.5 terabytes per day. Uh, and when during working days, it, it, reached, it reached already three terabytes per day. We have database 13 terabytes, but we okay. generate uh, and if, if uncompressed, it's like more than three terabytes of changes. It's so a the, lot. So the time that we will need will be. So the, the reason the reason I think you can get this time to be quite small is that it we once you, you you can like you can you can get the wall stream and you can be like pretty caught up on it. Like you can you can stream it for a while and then go okay, I'm kind of caught up and then send up the pause request for namespace ID one. And then you don't need to consume much more of the stream before you. Um... If you want this, you need additional uh, queuing in between, like Kafka or Sidekick. I don't know, because uh, you cannot pause wall stream. Wall stream is, is like we have single wall stream, and slots is just like uh, some virtual uh, mechanism on top of single wall stream. This is the problem. Yeah, I guess we cannot, I'm. We cannot. I'm still kind of confused it, now if, where one minute and one second, like what? Uh, okay, uh, how one can, minute. How, how do we derive one minute from the situation? Like one thing I, in my head, I think if the wall stream is too, is being written to so fast that we can't consume it um, quick enough, then it will be infinite. We'll never be able to catch up, right? right. But if the wall yeah. stream is written, if we're able to read and consume the wall stream as fast as it's coming, then we should be able to get our wall stream down to a very small size and then pause writes and then only read a bit more. Um, pause writes, uh, right. But pause. again, wall stream is a single entity. We, we can skip a lot of data, right? This will speed up and uh, decrease our latency. But I, I, we need to check everything. Like we, we need to start with just creating a, 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 some experiments, maybe uh, yeah. replic replicating the same level of uh, TPS as we have in production, the same machine, uh, um, identical machine, maybe same database. Uh, we have benchmarking environment, right? So, and then we need to just just to check uh, very basic things, like uh, even if we throw out all changes, like uh, to death now, right? So, yep. can we? Uh, avoid lags, lags at all, right? So I, I'm not sure because my experience is like, we have dozens of thousand uh, TPS. My experience is like thousands of TPS, right? So like, that's why I'm worried. Like we need yeah. to first check b very basic physical things be be before we uh, think about uh, application okay. level and so on. 
I mean, in, in my case, like I, in our case, I think it doesn't really matter whether it's one second or one minute. It, the right. chance that a, a user in, of a group is going to notice this is pretty low, except for like the highest volume groups. And the right. worst thing that they're going to get is a 500 while they click save on a page. And then they'll refresh that page and do it again. And, and then only a few users would be affected by that. And we do like a small subset of groups at a time, like, um, Right. Yeah, it, the impact will be pretty. Yeah, it defines only this uh, read-only state, and we can just uh, probably like again. I, I'm big fan of retrial logic on various levels. So on, on first on on like lower level and application, like like up to like I don't know like uh, thirty seconds, uh, we can we could re uh, perform retries ourselves. Then we can uh, dele delegate this retry logic to users, say, uh, yeah. using using proper error messages, like saying that you know we are in read-only state, we could not save your comment or something. Please retry in a minute. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I think I think you and I are actually probably saying the same thing. When I talk okay. about a block, a blocking, a blocking lock, that's pretty much the same thing as retries, because what really is going to happen is you're going to ask for the lock. And it's going to say, no, you can't have that. And then you go, okay, okay. let me wait 15 seconds. You ask for the lock again. You go, okay, yeah, you can have the lock now, right? Right. So, right. so right. Fu fundamentally, I think it is retries in either case. Um, okay. and, 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 and actually, it's a really good point you made about giving a really good error message to the user because that will that'll save us from getting bug reports for spurious 500s that appeared at right. really random right. times and we won't have to trace those down in the logs, et cetera. So, it, it won't help to some uh, non-human uh, clients. It's like sidekick jobs and or some, I don't know, like yeah. some additional yeah. things. Like well, sidekick jobs, sidekick jobs are going to retry automatically and they probably will retry. They'll probably fail with a certain exception message. The exception will be read only group access, right. read only group write access attempted ex exception raises sidekick will retry later. Our logs will have that message and users will receive a similar message. So I think that could right. all be. I'm, I'm good. still trying to understand why we, we have upgrades scheduled on Saturday. I'm still trying to understand uh, why we need to stop all services because someone mentioned that there are risks to lose data because of like some retry logic or something. And it's like, it takes uh, one hour to stop all services and start all services. And it takes only like a few minutes, like three minutes or so to upgrade Postgres itself. <laughs> so overhead yeah. of this stop and start services is huge. And you're saying that there is a retry logic there, so it's interesting. Yeah, psychic okay. has retry It's off logic topic. Too. It's, yeah, it's yeah. off topic. <laughs> so. yeah. it, it, that, that is going to be on topic when it comes to thinking about how our locks are going to be effective, right? Which exactly. is like mm -hmm. when things right. sit around for an hour with the possibility of writing after an hour, that's that's going to be problems when we implement our locking mechanism. But yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Cool. I think that was all the specific challenges we talked about. There was like this comment from Adam about we can potentially use this trick where we create a namespaces table for a shared um, for share and for update um, locks. And that well, can be our I locking. commented on this, right? If if we like the question is how long we should uh, how long we need to keep this lock because this level uh, select for update it's like transactional level. Uh, it will be kept until the commit. So you say begin, you do select for update. Uh, by the way, there is also for key update. No, it's not for no key update also. It's not, not important. And then once you commit, it's done. Uh, if we keep this transaction very long, long means like dozens of minutes, hour, it's quite long. We will, uh, SREs will receive a lot of alerts uh, related to uh, more than usual accumulated dead tuples because of the vacuum cannot delete them. Right, okay, that makes sense to me. So we're not gonna be doing Postgres any favors by using Postgres as our locking mechanism when Postgres is receiving terabytes worth of writes a day. Um, it's right. a system that's under such high load and it's forced to keep everything for the period yeah. of this transaction. Auto vacuum is quite simple in this case, logic is very simple. You lock some row in some table, but it means that who knows, maybe you will need the data from another table in right, your transaction. Yeah. So Autovacuum cannot delete uh, tuples in any table. Yeah, it's best. So, even, so yeah, actually, so this is actually similar to Redis in the sense that given the volume we expect from this, it, even if we implemented this in Postgres, we probably want to implement it in a separate Postgres database that wasn't receiving terabytes worth well, of Well, yes, or, or I, I explained there is also a mechanism called uh, advisory log, logs. Okay. And it, 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 it's possible to work on session level. 
So it's quite some logical log and application, like just just check it. I I provided link. Okay, check and it. so that might that might mean Postgres doesn't have to keep around so many dead tuples because it would only be right. what you've written right. in your but session. But we will need to think about like failures. Like I saw cases when implementation based on um, advisor logs uh, uh, needs some manual intervention when you you like something is wrong, stopped when you restart and the uh, application doesn't expect that uh, that's previous uh, mm. attempts of running application uh, added yeah. logs. So given, because given, they survive, survive uh, between sessions. Yeah, so, given how important maybe. and critical this locking mechanism will be, like it'll be used in every single write request. I think just logically, it would make sense to put it in a separate database. It's never gonna need to read or join from any tables that exist in GitLab. Well, um, well in this case, we can consider some something like console or yeah, that's what I was wondering. I don't know if console implements um, shared exclusive locks and I don't know if Redis does either, but presumably it can be done built upon Redis's single threaded model and the data structures that they have available. Um, okay, maybe. But in, in any case, if Postgres has got this, like this may be a pretty a, a good option for just say, okay, you have a separate logical database that only deals with locking and you can, you can have at that because it can handle incredibly high load. Um, for just those requests. Maybe the same database uh, is a registry of where uh, namespace is stored and which shard. Yeah, and, it, and and there may actually end up being logical benefits to that too, because you, you actually may, it may make sense to lock the update of the row, which says where the shards live, because you're about to actually change that. And you want to be the singleton process that is moving a group and using this lock where the group on the row that the group shard actually lives on. Um, but yes, yeah, so yeah, that could that could also work, mm -hmm. um, and it won't receive very high rights because groups aren't being created with that much volume. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. That's all good. Then I think those were the specific challenges, and I think I'm probably going to start working on this on Monday, and that'll probably mean me trying to set up the specific things that you described in this post with actual databases that look like GitLab databases to try to actually replicate this data across through completions. Yeah, I think uh, speaking of logical decoding, we need first to make very basic proof of concept before we go too far uh, with yeah. uh, developing. We need just to explore how feasible is it uh, to work at our scale. Right. Like so is there a specific thing you can propose an experiment that'll basically look like can we logically decode the volume of our wall? So like, let's take our archive database, look at that, to look at the write ahead log for that. And can we, can we decode those rows by row and check the, the, and filter them? The biggest faster? problem is that we need a primary database. Uh, you cannot create a logical slot uh, on replicas. This is a big problem. There's another problem that uh, can't we just um, just can't we just carry it through? Like the the the, the secondaries are the, the replica databases are already writing at the same volume as the primary. Can't we? Or right. you, there is no way to create it. I I've, I'm afraid we will need to deal with some hacks hacking uh, Postgres. When I itself. when I read the Postgres logical replication documentation, they said that anything can replicate the data then to something else as well. So, so what is it that from I'm from replica? You can. Uh, it says you can just you can carry them through. What was the um, cascaded? No. Yeah, maybe they use the word cascade. Um, try to. I think it says anything can be a publisher, including a subscriber. I think might be. Ooh, I don't know. If... I was thinking about uh, experimenting first, not in production environment, but in benchmarking environment. Once we are done with upgrade this weekend, we can uh, use, like we can ask not to destroy it. I think nobody will destroy it. So we can uh, use the same environment to simulate workload. We have some simulation tool. Of course, it's not uh, everything, but it's quite significant part of uh, real workload, uh, but with some random uh, parameters we can try to achieve the same level of wall generated, right? So, okay. and, and then work with it first. It, it will be 100% safe for production at least. So. Yeah, because obviously what we're saying, if we try to replicate from our primary, we're going to put extra load on it. 
if we try to run it's not an extra load because wall is is uh, uh, is uh, generated anyway and saved to disk uh, before even we save data itself because it's right ahead log but uh, we, we introduce additional risks to be out of disk space this is the most annoying thing okay also, uh, in terms of infrastructure, uh, if we work with uh, logical rep replication, we will need and decoding. Uh, we will need to uh, teach Post our Postgres cluster to survive uh, failovers. There is recipe undocumented, but it's working in multiple places, and even Patroni uh, support supports it. So, I mean, uh, there is additional work that needs to be done in, in infrastructure to work with logical. Okay, we're going to use logical replication from a primary and then a failover happens during that during one of these group moves and then we is it is it easier Slot for us is to lost. Say, Slot yeah, is so, lost. This but, is the problem. But, but maybe we can just say okay that's an abort and that that group move failed and we'll you do need it again to later. perform initial load again. This is uh, per documentation this is what you you need to do. But there are tricks uh, like uh, approved by hackers, <laughs> which uh, can be used to basically copy a slot and synchronize everything and it will be working. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm not super worried about that. I mean, it sounds like you said that there's a solution coming for that anyway, but e even in that case, worst case scenario, we just start that group move again. Right. If it's one time operation, it's, it's fine. But if it will be in future become uh, like the tool, for rebalancing and so on, it, it will be need to be done. Yeah, I agree. I guess for for one time, it's it's kind of kind of okay. I, th I think in future we're probably going to plan on failing over much more frequently as well, right? Like at the moment, our failure exactly. failovers might be like weekly, more right? Nodes, but... More 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 failovers, exactly. Right. Yeah. So if we fail over, if we start to fail over hourly, then we're going to be in trouble because we're going right. to need to be re resilient against failovers because they're going to happen and disrupt too many of our moves and yeah. Right. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna work on setting up the environment for this this week. I'll also create an issue for what was the the last thing you just said? Oh yeah, the benchmarking of right. benchmarking creating a yeah right ahead log that's as has as much volume in it as now, and then we're going to do logical decoding on that and and see if we can actually efficiently read that and filter rows. At not, the speed if, if we if we not lagging actually, so. without lagging, without falling without further lagging, and further behind, right. right? Yeah. So right, yeah. I I briefly discussed it uh, with Jose like three weeks ago already. That I I predicted mm. that it it will be raised, uh, but uh, we didn't have cycles before because of upgrade and other things. So mm -hmm. I hope that we will work on it soon. Okay, cool. I will I will um I will at least create an issue for how that will impact our sharding efforts as well. Um, Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, good. Thank you so much for your time. Sure. Thank you.